Let me leave with this. As you all consider the preparation of K-12 classical teachers, how would you describe the most essential features? If we want a holistic program that understands the K-12 classical uh, entity or phenomena, what is it that's going to touch upon the intellectual, the moral, the aesthetic facets of human nature, both theoretically and practically? Like what's, I'm giving you everything here, right? So it's, it's yeah, I want a short answer. This, this is gonna be haiku now, but no, so, what I'm really interested in is like, what are the essentials, right? As you outline this, as you try to, it's not just about making your pitch. How do you think of it conceptually so that you really are giving the full package, right? You're trying to equip a K-12 classical teacher. What are the essential features? If I may, I'm just gonna preface this with a confession. Um, I am not a master teacher. I do not teach teachers to become master teachers. Um, and I work for a university, which we've heard from several people here, is what screwed up liberal arts, and they think maybe we don't need them anymore. So, in a sense, when you hear all of that, you might wonder, why am I here talking about this? Um, I'm friends with Rob. Uh, no. Um, just all my friends, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just calling in favors. Um, no, look, but this is the thing, right? Is that... You know, I also teach, of course, like you do, and I am an administrator. And whatever you think about administration, it does serve a purpose, right? Someone has to go out there and listen to people, get that feedback, figure out what their needs are, and then talk to the people on your side and figure out if you can build something that's going to serve those needs. And that is the work that I do. And one of the reasons why my teachers aren't out here doing that right now is because they're actually teaching people right now, right? They don't have the leisure to come here and do this. So I'm in some sense their spokesman, but I think in some way I speak for everyone here when I say that it shouldn't just be us talking here. It's very important for us to hear from you. Okay, now that said, uh, thinking about the future of uh, developing master teachers and key things, um, I'd want to highlight that when you're thinking about what a university can do, of course you want to reflect on what you want it to do, what you think it can do, um, and what you're not looking for. Right? So you're going to have three ways that someone's going to become a better teacher. One is that they teach themselves to be a better teacher. And you might say, does that ever happen? Well, of course it happens. Homeschooling moms have been doing it. Right? Um, some teachers become better teachers within their schools, and that school develops a community in which you have master teachers and mentor teachers helping new teachers come in, and that's been a very, very common model now. And looking at both of those two things and then looking at the kinds of people who help those two groups, that's one of the reasons why someone might question whether a university has something to offer. Now, one of the reasons why I'm here, and, I, and of course the reason why these gentlemen are here as well, is because we do think there is something to, uh, that we have to offer. Um, we do have people that work in our institutions um, who do know the craft. And by the way, if I may, I'll just throw a shout out for Brian Williams here because he actually has taught in a classical school and led a classical school. So. He actually is a master teacher uh, and has taught master teachers. Um, but that said, so now I'm just going to very, very briefly talk about what I've heard in terms of feedback um, from the many fantastic teachers that I have met on the road. And you'll already know this, right? They start with um, some people here really know how to teach a class, but they don't know the content. They don't really understand what classical is. They don't know the tradition. They don't know what the liberal arts are. That's one thing. Another thing is, they know the liberal arts backwards and forwards, can't teach them teach out of a paper bag, teach themselves out of a paper bag. Um, actually, they, they have to be better than that to be in the school, but in any event, the point is that they might actually have the talent, they might have the right attitude, they might have some knowledge, but they need help to become more effective. And if a school is saying this to someone in the university, they're saying it because what they're doing inside their school isn't enough, and they would like some help, and they would like us to work together to do it, right? Um, and, you know, that kind of leads to the third thing is where I think it can start to become uh, really collaborative. Mm -hmm. And we learn from you, you learn something from us, and this is, you know, as we say, the tide that uh, raises all ships, right? You know, a university that draws from things that it learns from the different kinds of schools, then works with other schools and can actually take some of your wisdom and your insight and honestly your wisdom with your craft, like the art of teaching, and we learn more about what you're doing, and we integrate that into how we teach teachers, so then there's teachers at other parts of the country that are actually benefiting from your wisdom, right? Um, 
So in any event, and I think um, I just throw in two other, a couple of other quick things so you can see how I've layered these different ways in which we can work together and work toward developing uh, master teachers. But there's other aspects of it, right? Um, at these sessions, I've spoken of leadership. And in some sense, speaking about leadership, you're looking at, um, you know, school leaders. You know, do they know how to balance books? Do they know how to handle a land deal? You know, things like this. But there's also important elements of leadership for teachers that aren't covered in the things that I just said. Um, for example, are there things that we can talk about or things that can be done in the classroom that would make uh, it easier to deal with parents, right? That's something which is very important. And also, teachers act as leaders themselves when they're mentoring other teachers, right? So that's another important dimension of developing master teachers that we need to look at. Um, so in any event, with that introduction, and really my purpose was just to kind of frame things mm -hmm. and, uh, and also save you gentlemen the trouble if you thought that framing was all right, or you can improve it. But in any event, that's, that's, where, that's where I want to start. And I know some of you might have a ton of questions or suggestions, especially when it comes to the concrete details. And I want to very, very strongly encourage you to push back on that and to ask those questions now. If I got into it, I'd be talking for an hour, okay? So you guys drive these questions, please. Okay. That's why we invite Matt, because he's such a great guy. And he <laughs> doesn't mind leading off like that. Thanks, Matt. Um, uh, I, I always feel like this is worth saying. Um, Several of us see each other a lot. Matt and I see each other a lot. And so even though we all have our own programs, we, we feel like we're such collaborators in this whole work that it just never feel like competition. I always feel like I'm hanging out with friends and we're trying to figure this out together. Um, to your question, Rob, about what, <clears throat> I, I, I take it to be, what, what's the K-12 classical educator need? Yeah, um, gotta equip them, right? How are we setting them right, up? Right, well, I mean, uh, I, I think about that question I suppose the program we designed came out of my own experience of being a K-12 classical school teacher and just asking what do I wish I had known when I started teaching in a classical school. And I didn't find often that the teachers that we had in our school, they often had had good educations and they, were, they, they knew their fields fairly well. You know, they'd done a history degree or they'd done math. And so... They didn't necessarily need more education in their, in their discipline. Uh, I found, we all found at the school I was at that we, we needed to figure out what this thing called classical education was mm -hmm. because so many of us were advocates for classical education in our communities, with our parents. Uh, you know, we, we were advocating for classical education still with the students in our, in our classrooms. And trying to understand what is this thing, classical education, and are we really delivering it? Do we know what it really is? Um, and so I think from my experience in a K-12 classical school and lots of or conversations and friendships, um, I'm not just pitching our program, but I just think, I think in the terms of what, what's in our program, um, there's kind of basic Big basic principles of classical education. So for us, these individual courses we have on the true, good, and the beautiful, the three transcendentals that we all talk about a lot. But when I came into classical education, I was like, okay, I mean, I've heard of the true, the good, the beautiful. I've not spent a whole lot of time thinking about them. And so as a faculty, we started talking about them a lot, and it was really fruitful to think, how has the tradition thought about these three transcendentals? And then what do these look like? How do we embody these in our schools and in our classrooms? And so that's a piece of it. I really do think the history of education is really, really helpful for those of us doing thinking or saying we're recovering classical education. What, what do we mean by that? Like, do we really know what classical education was, how it came through the medieval era, into the Renaissance, into the modern era? And so I think it's helpful for the educator to know the history of education. How have we thought about education? How, how has it changed? Uh, how did the Greeks and Romans educate? How did that change during the um, era of Christendom into the Middle Ages? In order to frame, I, I suppose in order for me, that was important to recognize that I am, in a, I am stepping into a long tradition. And this confirmed me in my vocation as a teacher when I realized I, this, is a, this is a long tradition I'm stepping into and people have been doing this and thinking about this for a long time, including some of my you know, favorite philosophers or theologians. I think... So understanding some of the, the basics of just the kind of classical tradition, the transcendentals, the history, classical pedagogy, what that is, mm. what does it mean to teach classically, what does it mean to, 
What's it mean to teach classically beyond teaching some Latin, some great books and seminar? Because there's a lot more to it than that. And I think that's where we all were 25, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think we all realized, no, no, there's a whole lot more going on than that. Um, and then it's interesting, I think it's also helpful to have some understanding of the, the people we're teaching, the children we're teaching. What's it mean to be a child? What's it mean to be an adolescent? What's it mean to be a teenager? And how has the classical tradition thought about them? So when I think of the, the ideal classical educator, they know their field, but they also have some sense of those classical principles, uh, classical pedagogy, some history of what we're trying to do, and then some uh, robust philosophical understanding of human flourishing and, the, and the, the nature of the people that we're teaching. So that, that's what I would love to see um, sure. uh, across the spectrum. Good, guys. Yeah, so, uh, so I've, I've spent uh, some time uh, teaching uh, uh, American government and history teachers and interacting uh, with them. Uh, for, for a number of years, and so one thing that um, that strikes me always when I'm when I'm teaching these courses, interacting with teachers, is sort of the hunger for uh, for intellectual enrichment, right? And and um, sort of an escape from often the you know the the day to day uh, content delivery and uh, assessment and accreditation and those sorts of things. Um, talking you know mostly about uh, public school teachers, but also private and charter school teachers. Um, and so, so that's one thing that I think that, that we'll try to provide in our program as well, and I know that the others do as well, just this, this sort of high-level high intellectual engagement with uh, great texts, great works, primary source documents, things that uh, really enrich teachers' intellectual lives. Um, and, and that really, I think, has an effect on, um, on teaching as well. So, so that's one thing. Um, as I mentioned uh, yesterday that, um, that, you know, my view of education is of the formation of a relationship with the truth. And I think that that's different, you know, that's a different vision of education than the one that is, is uh, co most common in American education today. And I think it's consonant with, uh, with classical, classical liberal education, right? That you're forming a relationship with the truth, uh, with your students. And so I think that um, our teacher education programs will try to uh, deepen that relationship with the truth among teachers, uh, which will necessarily uh, rub off on their students and, and inform their teaching in various ways. Um, and I think that largely that happens through Socratic discussion of great texts um, and through leading Socratic discussions of great texts. I think that that helps deepen one's relationship with the, with the truth. Um, so I think that's an important piece. Also, so last month I was at a, a meeting on civic education, on American civic education at the Facebook headquarters, believe it or not, um, in, the, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, and Facebook's motto, as I learned, is uh, move fast and break stuff. I don't know, maybe that's common knowledge. I didn't know that. Uh, but that's Facebook's motto, right? Uh, move fast and break stuff. And so I was there to talk about civic education. And uh, that's a real uh, felt need now in American public education is, is how do we incorporate civic education, which has been neglected for so long, and nobody knows how to do it now. And I actually think that classical education uh, can, can really help fill that niche, in fact, because we live in a free society under a free government, a democratic republic, and we have to educate citizens for freedom. And I think that's exactly what classical liberal education does, is it educates uh, people to be free, flourishing, uh, flourishing individuals. I think this cut out. No, it's back. Okay. Um, so, so at any rate, I think that that's a real important uh, void that that we can all fill and kind of be part of this broader renewal of American education because it really does need to be renewed. And there's a sense not only among you know people like us in this room, but among American public education more broadly that it needs renewal. It needs something. And I think that we can actually uh, really help provide that uh, for American society as a whole. So, um, so I just add that piece in there. Adam, do you think that uh, maybe the Institute for Classical Education could adopt the model, slow down and take care of stuff? Does that work? Do you think that'll? Nah, probably that's not. A, that's, that's a good idea. Not, yeah, not, right. not in the age of the viral video. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate you all uh, uh, coming to this panel. Um, one thing that I wanted to say uh, is, is that I'm interested in this um, whole question about how do we train teachers for classical schools, and I've been interested in it for quite some time. Um, it's interesting that with the development or the rediscovery or the rejuvenation of classical education, there are elements, uh, the foundational elements that have come alongside 
as well, like professional organizations uh, as this, uh, are the publishers, but then also the need for institutions of higher education to come alongside as well. And so what I, I'm keenly interested, because I have come out of the, the education establishment, is that I see this as, as kind of a rejuvenation or a rediscovery of, I, I don't know if we would call it classical teacher education. In other words, a recovery of that the people we have in the front of the room are not, are not technicians, um, as, they, as they have been viewed for about 100 years in American education, that they don't really need to know anything just as, as long as they understand the process and the technique of, uh, of a delivering information, everything will be fine. Um, what I've seen is, is that uh, that has not worked. Um, and I think that you can look at, at American education over the last 100 years that it's not only that the content was weak, but that the people who were teaching the content um, were not prepared either. They were not living the lives of, uh, uh, of a well-ordered soul. Um, and so I see a rediscovery of uh, a rejuvenation of classical education. Um, out in American education today, uh, the establishment education, there's this kind of notion of, of uh, uh, classroom ready teachers coming out of the undergraduate experience. Uh, quite frankly, I think that's a myth. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you can be classroom ready coming out of your education experience. Um, your first year of teaching is going to, as all of you know who are educators, it's going to be difficult. And you can do as much as you can to get teachers ready for that first year, but it's going to be challenging. Um, if you look at the research even coming out of the education industry itself, uh, the process courses, the methodology courses, most teachers look back on those courses and say they were a waste of time. Uh, the only element in their student teach or in their teacher preparation experience that they did point to as a valuable experience was getting into a classroom, their student teaching experience. Um, what we're discovering is that teachers coming out of the undergraduate experience, coming into a school, uh, a much more kind of a formative experience is having a good mentor um, to come alongside and and to be able to engage in a conversation, and that that's where true teacher education occurs in those first few years of, uh, of uh, teaching. And that's why I think the programs that we're talking about here are, uh, are our version of classical teacher education, that um, having students come out of the undergraduate experience, go into the classroom, spend that first very difficult, challenging year, maybe year two, maybe year three, um, have three years of teaching experience and then going back to experience a richer, uh, a deeper kind of experience that is not divorced from content. Content plays a central role, but then you're talking about the methodologies um, and the people who are actually in those programs have some experience to draw from. And that's why I think these programs are inspiring. Uh, they really are, because I think the teachers are finally ready to be able you know, to go out um, um, and have the kinds of conversations that matter and have the experiences in classrooms with, uh, with real students to be able to draw from um, in order to get the most out of their graduate experience. Mm -hmm. Can I say just sure. one more thing? Sure. I mean, I, I think when I think of the the formative power of my own teachers and what caused them to have an impact on me. I think we also have to recognize, and I've said this before, that our classical teachers have to be the kind of people we want our students to become. We've got to have classical educators when you ask what they need. They need to model these kinds of things in, in our own lives. So as, as an educator, do I read books outside of prepping for my class? Do I have long conversations with friends about big ideas? Do I know how to enjoy a beautiful meal? Do I go to see Shakespeare plays? Mm -hmm. Do I, am I able to model for my students and am I practicing in my own life the kinds of things I want my students to practice in, the, in their life? Sure. And, and that's, that's huge and that's no small thing. And when you have a faculty of friends who are doing that in a school together and students see that, in some ways that's going to be mm. as uh, formative, or if not more so, than sometimes what goes on in the classroom. And yeah. so I don't want to just address what we're doing in the classroom. I think that's, that's important. 
but recognizing that this is a way of life and a way of being that our teachers need to model and that our schools need to create space for our teachers to, to model right. this and, and live this kind of way. Yeah, you know, to add to that, just quickly, I've seen a number of our headmasters within the Great Hearts Network who have deliberately and intentionally carved out time for their faculty. They've been just devoted to making sure that when they have a break, they have a break. Uh, it's not easy to do. Uh, we have a rather elaborate assessment system and, you know, these narratives where they're describing a child with some detail as to what they're seeing and how they're growing. And I have seen these headmasters just guard their time to make sure and pace them and prepare them so that when that Thanksgiving break arrives, well, it's, not usually, it's usually the Christmas break or the holidays, right? You're off and you need to be off and please go enjoy your family and go, you know, see Swan Lake or what have you. But... Um, the nutcracker, perhaps. Anyhow, so just the administrative piece that you mentioned earlier, uh, so crucial. Right? It absolutely that, is, that we, is crucial that to we protect block that and space. For them, that's right. That, that's so that right. They to can have leisure. Right? That's right. We used to practice uh, at our school. We we had a I don't know. We had one of these end of year barbecues or first of year barbecues, and we all just sat around in, in somebody's front room for hours and we're talking about education, mm -hmm. and so many fruitful things came out of that that we started practicing. Um, Scole in the Scole, uh, leisure in the library. Mm -hmm. And we would create space in a day where professor teachers could just go into the school library and sit and be with each other and lock the door and students knew that's what we were doing. And it was really just to try to create some space for us to that's have right. conversations with each other. Very important. Um, with, yeah. So Dan, you mentioned, oh, you want another? Yeah, you got another piece there? Please. I just want to, you know, in my opening remarks, I was trying to give an overview of things and I just want to mention something that, uh, I realized is very important and was overlooked, um, is of course the role in teacher training. So I mentioned homeschoolers and schools and then collaborating with universities, but of course there are also people who have been um, serving classical schools and homeschoolers to help teach their teachers and they've been doing it for decades. And I apologize if I miss anyone here, but you know we have Professor Carroll over here and Christopher Perrin, uh, Phil Kilgore. So, I know, I know that BCSI is connected to Hillsdale, right? But it's not, we're not talking about a university program, right? So I also think that right. that's important looking into the future is first of all, that we acknowledge the enormous debt that we have to the work that you have done and that you continue to do and in which you excel. And that we also give some careful thought to how we can work together, mm -hmm. right? And uh, really briefly, an ancient illusion, you know, in Thucydides, uh, the Athenians are going to invade Sicily. And Hermocrates says to the Sicilians, I know we like to all kill each other, but the Athenians are coming, so why don't we get together and expel them, and then we can go back to killing each other. Um, we've said this many times, we're not competitive. If there's ever going to be a time that we're, you know what, I look forward to the time when we can be competitive with each other, because that would mean that we have won, right? Um, so, but for now, it's important for us to get together, to talk, to figure out who's good at what, and to support each other. And, uh, and that's also by way of really thanking you and what you're doing here, because that's one of the things that's making this possible. My okay, pleasure. thank you. My pleasure. So Dan, you mentioned uh, institutional life, uh, and you each represent four different institutions of higher education, colleges and universities. I am interested in the kinds of uh, perspectives that come from those institutions, how they see this work you're doing, uh, from the university's, you know, perspective, and then also how you're working within those universities to, to position classical education. So if you can tell us a little bit about institutional life as it relates to classical education. Yeah, it's been, um, yeah, it's been great. Uh, it, at Hillsdale, um, when I arrived in 2006, um, if you came to one of the earlier panels, you heard me say that we had a traditional teacher preparation program like many of the state universities, and, and uh, over the first two years I was there, the state standards, which we were already struggling to meet uh, because of our commitment to liberal arts education, and the standards were often headed in a very utilitarian technique, kind of an approach to teacher education. So we were just trying, um, with our limited number of courses, just to meet those requirements. And, and it was hard because we wanted to be dealing with the stuff that really mattered. You know, we wanted our students to be reading The Republic and talking about what does it say about education. But we were trying to tick off all, all of these uh, standards that was required by the state. 
Um, and so uh, when we decided um, in uh, 2009 that we were going to end that and we were going to actually create a teacher preparation program or an education program, a classical education minor within the institution, there was some skepticism. Um, um, there was probably a lot of skepticism, um, not just within the institution. In other words, other departments that had got used to um, using our department maybe even as a recruiting device. We have a very healthy athletic program at Hilsa. We're a Division II institution, and when it was announced that we were going to end our teacher preparation program, our state certified teacher preparation program, I had to go down to the athletic department and sit around while eight, eight of the football coaches quizzed me on the wisdom of getting rid of a teacher certification program. Um, uh, I remember meeting with uh, the volleyball coach, and some of the Hillsdale people know who this is, and trying to explain um, uh, where we were going. What's incredible, and I'm just going to use a vignette, a little example, what's incredible is that we committed to it, um, and we said, this is consistent with the mission of the institution. This is who we are, and you just have to ha have a faith that there is a community out there that is thriving and, and that is longing for institutions like ours to take a lead. Because there's so many institutions that are, are not even aware that this is going on. I can tell you about professional conferences where I would use the word trivium or classical education and professors of education would come up to me and ask me questions. I don't know what you're talking about, trying to explain them. So anyways, let me go back to the volleyball coach. So he, he had a little bit of trouble understanding why we would end the teacher certification program, this, this program uh, that we had. And I had to just say, just, tr just trust me, there's a thriving community out there. Um, uh, and he was recruiting you know, his, uh, his athletes to come to Hillsdale. Two years after that conversation, he brought a recruit to my office who was interested in Hillsdale. She was out of Florida. She was highly recruited by a number uh, of the universities and the mother and the daughter were across from me and, and the volleyball coach was kind of standing behind and I was trying to explain um, about our approach to education and the mother said, this is the kind of education we love. The volleyball coach who was skeptical about us going in this direction said, listen, I was skeptical as well, but I'm a total believer now in it. I mean, what a transformation, right? And there's nothing like success, you know, to convince people. Um, but just the quality of the courses that we've had um, has attracted a, a completely different kind of student, a higher quality student. Um, so let me go back to the college community. Within the college community, there was some skepticism about what we were trying to do. And they were very, very concerned, I said in a previous you know, panel that they thought the education program would completely die on the vine. If you don't have the certification as a, the carrot, why would anyone take your classes? Well, it's interesting. If you provide classes with meaningful, rich uh, content, they come. It, it's amazing. Um, one thing that we did struggle with uh, um, was the alumni, people who had come through our teacher preparation program, and they had identified themselves as graduates of the teacher preparation program, and they had connected, you know, anytime they would come back, they would, you know, identify themselves as education students. They were the ones who were complaining the most uh, because it was more part of their identity than anything else. It wasn't necessarily that they really loved the training, but it was, they were teachers from that teacher education program. So we had to deal with that, but we no longer have to deal with that. So with inside the community, the college itself, it took a little bit of persuading, bringing them along, um, but I don't have anyone now coming to me and you know, saying, what were you thinking 10 years ago about eliminating the certification program? It just doesn't even come up anymore. Hmm. So. Well, yeah, so uh, ASU, as you all know, is a, is a small classical liberal arts college, uh, so. <laughs> 
so no, but actually it's, it's, a, it's been a great institutional fit actually in a lot of ways for the, the programs we're building, uh, the Masters in Classical Liberal Education and Leadership, and our undergraduate curriculum, which also is classically inspired and uh, based in primary text and core text. Um, so in the sense that, uh, that ASU views its mission uh, largely in terms of community embeddedness and serving the, the local community, uh, that's a big part of the university's mission here. And so uh, we have such a, a large flourishing community of classical uh, schools and classical homeschooling communities, just a big classical education ecosystem in this area right here, spearheaded by great hearts. Um, and, and led by them in many ways, uh, that that is seen by the university as a, as a real uh, community need, right? We have, it's a community need here, particularly. So, um, so they've been very, very supportive of everything we're doing because of that. Um, and so that's, uh, so that's been, it's been an unusual and sort of uh, uh, serendipitous um, coincidence of interest. They want to serve the community, and the community they want to serve is a classical education community, partly, right? So, um, so that's been good for us. Um, also, ASU, uh, as, a, as a huge university, and, and I think as a university with the, the biggest um, online presence of any university in the country, uh, that they, they have resources to offer us. So uh, eventually our master's program will be a hybrid, um, you know, online and in-person sort of program, and that will enable us to is expand our reach as well and, um, and be more flexible for teachers. And so, so ASU's resources in that regard, I think, are a real um, asset to us as we develop our program, um, that we can, we can be creative about how we, um, how we structure it. So, um, yeah, so, so although, you know, ASU is so very different, you know, in many ways, you know, from Hillsdale and Dallas um, and, and Templeton, and uh, it's very different, but um, uh, for various reasons, it's ended up being a very um, auspicious sort of connection. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're, we feel very supported here. Yeah. Okay. We're in a little different situation. Maybe we're a little bit more like ASU. We're a college within a university. So um, it's a little bit like, I, mean, I, I came from the University of Oxford where you have 38 colleges and six halls that are part of the university. So we're Templeton Honors College within Eastern University, and it, it, it's an easy fit for the Honors College because we've been doing great books, classical education for 20 years, so it just makes sense for us out of this life that we've already been living to offer uh, this Master of Arts in Classical Ed. Eastern itself is a little more skeptical. I mean, I mean for them, I have to convince them that, that, I mean, Dan put it, well, there is a community out there. There is a, if you will, to use the language I sometimes have, there's a market out there for it. And so, but they have to take my word on that unless I can recruit students into it and, and show them that there is a need and there is a world out there of classical education that other people in the university don't know outside of our, our college. So it's an easy fit for the Honors College. That makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a I have to sell it to the university and can keep selling it to the university um, until we really get it, get our program off the ground and, and, and really rolling. So okay. yeah, I, I live kind of in that in between space there. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, in terms of institutional culture, if, if any of you came to the other panels we did where we briefly presented our programs, I mean, I essentially spoke about it there, that, you know, at the University of Dallas, you know, we really think about the student as a human being. Um, we think about their life as a whole and what that life aims at. Um, and you can make general statements about that, but for different individuals it's going to be different thinking about the different vocations that accord with people's talents. Um, and even though those are general statements, it's nevertheless good to just keep them in mind, right? Because we do forget that sometimes. Um, and by the way, I'll add, and I said this in my, in my talk, that of course virtue is extremely important, respect for faith is important, understanding tradition is important, but if you want to look at someone's life as a whole, getting a job is also important. Right, um, uh, and then there's also details. Right, um, one can be very virtuous, but you know you need to balance the books and other things if you're going to be able to support your family. So we do think that all of that is important. Um, but something I want to elaborate on also as concerns something else I said in the earlier panels about great books programs. You know that don't attend to virtue and those that do. Um, 
this is not, I just want to elaborate what this means in terms of the culture of our university. Attending to virtue doesn't mean dictating to people what virtue is. And I think that this goes back, I mean, unless one is God, in which case, yes, please go ahead. But, but otherwise, for us mere human beings, it's not for us to dictate to others. Um, we can present possibilities, but this isn't because we're not serious about virtue. This goes back to an educational principle in Plato's Republic. If you want someone to act virtuously, you have to inspire them to act virtuously. Right? It actually says that. If you do it through the laws and you coerce them, it's like keeping a sick patient alive with medication. Right? You're not actually helping them to become virtuous. They have to see it for themselves. They have to go there on their own. You help and you support them, but you don't make them do it. Right? And one of the ways that you do that is by awakening wonder in them, encouraging them to inquire. And ultimately, if you think that virtue is real, you don't need to tell other people about it because if you think it's out there, then if you help people to inquire and to pursue, you know that they're going to find it. Right? Now, there's a better or worse way to do that, and we can discuss that. But in any event, I just wanted to add these details to my comments before just about the institutional culture. And a third point I want to make, and I think that uh, this also evokes something that you were saying, Dan, um, is that it is, very, it is very, very important to think about what actually goes on in the classroom and to have experience in the classroom and to have someone who can who really knows what they're doing, who can sit there, look at you, and say, you know what, okay, that's good, you did this, you did this, okay, do it again, this looks great, okay, do this. No, no, let's do it again, and to talk to other people who know what they're doing so that it, it really is, it is an art, and uh, that is extremely important to us in our development of our, of our programs and looking forward to the future. And again, I encourage you guys to ask about details if you're curious about the practical side um, of teacher formation. But that's a, that's a good segue because I, we all have agreed that these programs, perhaps uh, as much as anything, are drawing upon the wisdom of artisans or craftsmen, uh, both from our tradition that we have as exemplars, but those who are in there fighting the good fight today. So what areas do you need support you know, to be informed, you know, even really leadership, to come to you or to inform what you're doing by way of these programs. So I'm really now thinking of this audience out here, going to say, you know, in a couple of words, you just say, I, we need this, this, these three things, uh, and then we'll let them speak to you and ask you other questions. Okay? What do you need from them? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, that's a great question. W one thing that I wanted to say before that, though, is um, a few of us met uh, on Sunday, and there was a reference. Um, it was the first time that I met Brian. I just met Adam less than an hour ago. Um, um, I met Matt in October, um, and I've known Rob for a long time. But um, one of the interesting things, and it's very hard in the moment to identify uh, the, the, the creation of something larger, um, but uh, I, I just want to say, Rob, you know, bringing us all together here uh, could be the start uh, of something pretty big um, in that I had heard about all of these programs, but I, I didn't have a face to put on them. So um, we were talking um, about how what we're doing is not within the field of education. It's not necessarily within the classics department. It's not within the English department. It's this other thing. Um, and just all of us getting together um, to have this conversation with all of you and in front of you um, could be the start of something very, very large. Um, just to ha um, so I just wanted to mark that, um, and I wanted to thank you for that. Um, what we need is uh, we think we have a pretty good idea about what education is, um, and it's come out in these meetings. It's come out uh, in these conversations. Um, we think we know some things, um, and we think that what we know will help teachers become um, successful, um, good models uh, of what it means to be a human being in the classroom. Um, but we also need feedback. Um, our students are going out into, into your schools, um, and they're teaching, um, and we need to know things. We need to know uh, about the practical things. What, what do you think they could learn while they're with us, right? That maybe they wouldn't be able to learn um, in the everyday of the classroom. And so I, I you know, um, I 
typically collect information just through short conversations um, with headmasters. What do you see? We host a job fair every year um, in the winter time, and headmasters come. And, and the fact that they continue to come back and hire more of our graduates suggests that we're doing an all right job. But in those small conversations, just one-on-one, -on -one, um, I really appreciate the feedback in terms of, you know, it'd be good if you, if you, you know, talked about this. It'd be good if, you, if your teachers had an understanding of this. Um, so those casual conversations are great, but um, I would just throw out an invitation, um, you know, to continue to, to email, make, uh, make comments to us, call us, and let us know about the teachers who are coming out of our institutions and how well they're doing and what areas that they really need to work on. So open communication, because um, we're trying to serve you. Um, when, when Hillsdale turned its back on the certification you know, uh, world, um, we specifically turned towards classical schools, and I said this in a previous panel, we uh, surveyed every classical school we could find, and we said, what do you want? We think we do some certain things well, and we think we know what teachers need, but what do you want? And um, that took time to collect that information, and I don't want it to be a one-time event. So the more feedback that we can receive from all of you, the better. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, in addition to that great point about feedback, I think that's, uh, that's a really, really good point um, that would be very helpful. Um, also, I think uh, something occurs to me is um, the sort of fostering of, of networks and national networks um, to, to sort of coordinate uh, the mentorship and practicum aspects of our uh, teacher education programs. Um, I think that, that could be very helpful uh, so that um, there's a, a body of, of, um, of teachers and of schools and of individuals in various areas around the country who are aware of of, the, of our programs, of what we're doing, and of our, uh, the teachers we're educating who can help us to, to educate them. Um, and, um, and, you know, particularly as, as our, we have nat sort of a national reach for all of our, our programs, I think that sort of uh, coordination and networking uh, is something that we can continue to build up. And events like this are really, uh, of course, key, key components of, of doing that. And I think two, two things come to mind, Rob, to your question. Um, one, just hearing from people, what, what's, what are the points of tension and friction in your schools or in your, in your, in your classes, in your classrooms that you, you want to get a better handle on or that we could provide um, some education on? Uh, I just said, we have four of our MAT students here at the conference, and I just sat with several of them and just said, what do you need? What, what are you learning from us that's not translating well? Or what, 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 are, you, what are you finding in your classrooms uh, that you, you just need, need more of or, or more thought on? The other question that I think is helpful to hear is what would you like to get together and reflect on? I mean, one of the nice things about coming to any of these programs or, or ours is just to be able to step out of the classroom, to have some, a, a small, almost retreat sabbatical to say, what, what do you, and to, to think about the kinds of things you just don't have time to think about. So that's helpful to hear. What would you like to reflect on with other people, other educators from around the country? And then the other thing that's really helpful for us is just how to make this possible uh, for teachers in your schools. Uh, how, you know, uh, what, what, not the content of what you need, but how can we structure our program or our courses or our offerings that will serve and support schools? I know not everyone has the opportunity or for whatever reason, to come into and do a full master's program, but it'd be helpful to even hear what if, you know, if you could think of like one course or one set of workshops that you want every teacher in your school to go through, what would that be? And then for us to go, oh, could we design something like that where we could say, all right, not every teacher in your school can do our MA program, but what if you get 10 of your teachers together? What could we offer 10 of your teachers? One kind of thing, that, that kind of feedback. Because yeah. I mean, we're talking about programs, but there's no reason we have to just think in terms of programs as academic institutions. I don't want to do the work that a lot of other people have been doing, the Classical U or the Searcy Institute's mentoring program. They're doing great stuff, but if there's a way we can fill a niche uh, like that, that that they're not, then that's really helpful feedback yep. uh, for us to hear as well. So I don't know. Thank you. Um, what I would ask, 
uh, is uh, twofold in a way, and I actually kind of think of um, what you were saying, Brian, that you know, teachers should be the kind of people that you want your students to aspire to become. Um, I was talking to uh, someone who I, sh I, I shan't name, but, um, and he was talking about humility. And humility is, of course, extremely important in, the, in a secular classical school, Socratic knowledge of ignorance, and it's also important in, uh, in a religious classical school. And he was talking about this humility, and I said, okay, so the students that graduate from your school, you think they're coming out feeling really humble? And he paused and smiled and said, no, right? He said, actually, I think they come out thinking they really know a lot about the world, and they think that they're actually better than people in other schools and things like this. And he said, you know something? I need to think about that, because now I'm wondering if we're fulfilling our mission. Um, I didn't actually say it to cause quite that level of, of reflection, but, but the point is that I think the kind of work that we're doing and the environment in which we're doing it, in which we are constantly being challenged to explain why we've chosen it, why we're dedicated to it, and I think it can create a culture of patting ourselves on the back a lot, and sometimes glossing over areas in which we need to attend or to approve. And in any event, just for any normal human being, it's just kind of hard to be self-critical. Um, right? And regrettably, it doesn't get easier as you get older, as I'm discovering. So what I'm asking for here is just that we try as much as we can to be open with each other um, and to trust each other. I'm going to come to that in just one second, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. And, and to be humble and to just to be frank and just kind of say, like, look, these are problems. The fact that there are problems is not a reflection on some failing of ours, per se. It's a problem and we need to fix it, and let's talk about how to fix it, right? Um, and one last thing about trusting each other is that, um, you know, recently at the university we hired a lady who I think is just a fantastic teacher of teachers, and she doesn't have a degree to her name, but she was a homeschooling mom, taught in a classical school, has taught teachers, she's written curriculum. And we went to a school and some teachers came up and said, oh, we might want to enroll in this program. We had no idea a university would ever hire someone like this. I'm like, well, what do, what do you think we're here for? Why do you think I'm talking to you? And one of the things I started to realize is that, you know, we've been doing this for a little while now, and there's a lot of teachers out there that aren't talking to us because they think that we just think we're experts and we look down on them. I actually suspect there is that. They were actually surprised that we would include someone whose major credential was a, being a homeschooling mom in our program. And I think that I speak for everyone here when I say that is simply not true. I mean, it, is, it, it might be true in some circumstances, but it's not true of these, these individuals or these institutions. And again, for us to think about how we're going to go forward. So openness, humility, self-criticism, and above all, I think we need to trust each other. Thank you. I'm going to open it up. We are kind of on the clock here. Going to take a couple questions. We'll start up there. <laughs> um, and She's like a job, man. <laughs> I have too many jobs right yeah. now, but um, I represent a, a couple hundred homeschooling moms who are following my journey while I'm out here in West Virginia over the last couple of days. So if you could say maybe just three things to a homeschool mom who feels compelled to give her children a classical education, what do you feel like is important to speak into homeschooling moms who are really trying to do this? Like I have a Bravo. Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought you, you. I'll take that too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say first. Uh, first, uh, well done. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we would have somebody else answer this, but I would just say A, I mean, well done and carry on. Two, you don't have to do it perfectly. Like, I know a lot of people feel a lot of pressure and a lot of stress to get this right. And our teachers feel this to get it right in our classrooms. And especially, you know, homeschool families just say, I mean, we're all fallible and we're trying to figure this out. And so you don't have to get it. You don't have to get it perfect. Um, that's what I would say. So well done, carry on. You don't have to get it perfect. And um, recognize that, you know, come alongside the journey with your children, that you're learning alongside them and, and make it a, a, a shared journey of discovery and wonder and delight, because as we know, it's 
you know, it's the parents have the most significant influence in mm -hmm. so many of our, our kids' lives, as they should. And so I think when you take some of that pressure off, then when the, the homeschool parents can feel some of that wonder and delight and discovery alongside them, that's fantastic. So. Yeah, and I just add to that, you know, sec second these comments as well and just say that, you know, as a, as a work at home parent, you know, just know that you're doing the most important job in America. And I think that that's absolutely the case. I think that, uh, that you know, homeschooling and being a work at home uh, parent um, is the most, by far the most undervalued uh, in a society wide uh, job that people do in this country today. It's, it's absolutely the most important job, more important than anything that, uh, that we do. I really believe that. I think it needs to be valued much more highly by society at large. I think we need to take steps to do that um, in, on many fronts. Um, and uh, I just think it's, it's absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial. And so just try to you know, keep reminding yourself of that every day. And, um, and I think that society will, uh, over time, also recognize it and value it more because it's, uh, yeah, the most important job in America. Yes, Lumo. I would just like to chime in. I mean, part of the, uh, the Institute's purpose is to really provide resources. Yes, we want to be the forum that makes these things happen, but we have not forgotten. We recognize, I recognize, probably two-thirds of those receiving a form of classical education in this country. It's about a half a million, by my estimate. They're at home with their parents getting, again, a, an utmost education. So we have the highest respect. We want to support this. I think you're going to see more resources appearing and I know there are plenty of folks, including obviously Classical Academic and Memoria and the various publishers that have gotten into this market, as well as the Classical Conversations and the various support, but we want to continue to support those of you who've chosen to care for your children in that way. It's just powerful. Uh, one more question, yeah, Luma. Yeah, the essentials, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am, they need to like them too. What's that? They need to like teenagers. They well. do need to like teenagers. <laughs> I'm sorry to prematurely cut this short. I assume these gentlemen could stay for a couple of minutes. If you have questions and you'd like to address them individually or just down here, um, I have to run. I know we've got to catch something just up here with 10 minutes left. We are formally concluded. Uh, thank you to everyone who stayed the course. You're still here, but now you're done and I release you and bless you. Get out there. Okay, go back to the work that is most necessary. <laughs> <laughs>